Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I apologize for the uh, uh, limited seating. We obviously uh, underestimated uh, uh, the demand. And um, hopefully uh, those who don't have seating can at least hear the proceedings from outside. Uh, my name's uh, Shanto Iyengar. I'm simply uh, the moderator for this event, uh, which is the, uh, the McClatchy Symposium on the Election. Uh, the panelists uh, don't really need any uh, introduction, but I will nonetheless give you a, a brief uh, biographical summary of our uh, distinguished crew here. Alphabetically, uh, Dan Baltz is the national political correspondent for the Washington Post, where he has covered uh, politics and political campaigns for as long as uh, most people can remember. Uh, PBS uh, viewers probably know him as well as a regular on uh, Washington Week. Uh, Dan is the author of uh, uh, several books, most recently based on the 2008 election, The Battle for America 2008. Uh, Dave Brady, uh, who will actually be speaking last, is the deputy director of the Hoover Institution, uh, professor of political science and of uh, leadership values at the GSB. He has written extensively on Congress, uh, the politics of healthcare reform, and political uh, polarization. Uh, Matt Kaminsky is a member of the uh, Wall Street Journal editorial board, uh, has also written for the Financial Times and The Economist. Uh, he was previously the editorial page editor for the Wall Street Journal's uh, European edition. And finally, uh, Doug Rivers, is the Chief Innovation Officer for YouGov, which is of course a major online survey research organization. Uh, those of you who are really political junkies will know that their track record during the 2012 presidential campaign was rated as impressive by no less a person than Nate Silver. And I would add uh, to that that in comparison with the Gallup poll, uh, their performance was nothing less than spectacular. Uh, Doug is also a professor of political science at Stanford and a senior fellow at Hoover. So the ground rules uh, for this evening are I've asked the panelists to limit their comments to about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, we're going to go in two phases here. The first two uh, panelists, uh, Boss and Rivers, will focus on the election and the dynamics of uh, voter behavior. Uh, so why did Obama win and Romney lose? And Kaminsky and Brady will focus on the aftermath. Uh, so what does it all mean for governance, uh, the fiscal cliff, and the things that will be taken up by the next Congress? Uh, with that, I will ask Dan to kick off the proceedings. Thank you, Shanto. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I thought when Shanto was doing the uh, opening there, he said that this uh, panel need not be interrupted, and I thought, these are tough rules here at Stanford, but, um, but I obviously misunderstood. Uh, the size of this crowd is very uh, heartening uh, and, and uh, puts to rest my theory that everybody in this country was ready for this election to be over uh, and did not want to revisit it. So uh, either you are an unusual group or I'm completely wrong about uh, what people thought about this campaign. Uh, because there are so many people here, we're going to try to limit our remarks to even a little less than 15 minutes so that we have plenty of time for questions. So uh, I will make a couple of points and turn it over to Doug, um, and I will talk a little bit about kind of why Obama won. I think there are two points that I'd, I'd like to make. The first is that, that the, the president succeeded in, in making this election not simply about him. Uh, and the second point is his campaign succeeded uh, in making the electorate uh, more in their favor than the Romney campaign had expected. Um, the, the, the first point is, I mean, it's obvious, but it's worth dwelling on for a minute. Um, you know, there was always a question about whether this campaign would be a, a referendum on the president or not. And the, the Romney campaign had a theory of this election, which they held to throughout. Uh, this was not something they came to at the end or, or you know, imagined somewhere in the middle of it, but it was their it was their theory from the very beginning, and that was that that this would be a, a, a an economy based election that that given the state of the economy, 
given everything we saw in the polls about people's attitudes about the biggest problem in the country, uh, that the economy dominated in a way that it hasn't in a number of elections, um, and that the president's performance and, the, and the, the dissatisfaction with the president's performance would be the driving force um, for most voters. Um, they, they looked at the president's overall approval rating, uh, which through much of the campaign was below 50%, uh, and argued to us and, and everybody who would uh, listen to them that an incumbent president rarely gets much more than his final approval rating. And so as this election was playing out and you would talk to people in Boston about kind of the state of play, their argument was the president's at pick it, 47 percent, um, an incumbent can't win at 47 percent because in the end he's not going to get much more than 48 or 48 and a half percent. The, the, third, or the last thing they believed was that in an election like this, given that an incumbent always has built-in advantages, uh, that the overall polling um, would not show Romney ahead until the very end. That, uh, that the election would break and it would break in Romney's direction, but not until probably you got through the final debates and you were into the last, uh, the last couple of weeks of the campaign, if not the last week of the campaign. And I think it's one of the reasons that, that, uh, that they thought, even up to election day, uh, that they had a, a, a genuine opportunity to win the campaign. And if you saw uh, Governor Romney's concession speech that night, you knew that this was not a speech he had thought he was going to be giving that night and was somewhat surprised by the outcome. Whether he should have been or not is a different story, but I think that was, that was part of the case. The Obama team obviously knew all this about the problem that they faced and, and understood from the beginning that if this did become a referendum uh, on them, they would probably lose the election. Um, and so, first of all, they wanted to make it a choice. Uh, and, they, and they went out to try to create a, a different kind of campaign. They did two things about this. I mean, their, their notion was essentially, we can't let this campaign be about current economic conditions. We've got to make it about something other than that, even though they knew it was going to be economic based. Bill Clinton has always said, every campaign is about the future, not the past. And what they figured out was a way to leapfrog over essentially the current state of the economy uh, and particularly the president's handling of the economy during the first several years of his presidency uh, and make it about something more about the future. Uh, their focus clearly was to make it about the middle class. Who would, be, who would be better in the future for the middle class? Who would do the kinds of things that middle class voters felt were going to help them, uh, not just in the next 30 days or 60 days after the election or the next year, but well into the future. Who would create a better America for the middle class? If you look at the exit polls, what's interesting is that, um, and, and Romney people have said this after the election, that, that um, in many ways they say he won on the big issue. There were 59% of voters who said the economy was the biggest issue in their decision making and they supported Romney 51 to 47. Um, another 15% said the deficit, debt deficit issue was the big issue, and they voted for Romney 66 to 32. Um, on another part of the sort of the big debate about, about the role of government, 51% of the electorate on election day said that government is doing too much. Um, 43 or odd percent said that government should be doing more. So in essence, Romney was winning that, by a narrow majority, Romney was winning that argument about the role of government. Uh, those folks who, who thought government was doing too much voted for Romney 71 to 24. Um, and a majority of the country, though, though by election day a bare majority as opposed to 65 or 68 percent as we had seen earlier, said the country was heading in the wrong direction, a uh, basic kind of mood of the country question, and those voters voted for Romney 84 to 13. So if you look at that, you would say, well, Romney had a theory of the case, and, and in his own mind he, he sort of won that. Uh, but then you look at the flip side of this and, and what aided Obama. Um, Obama's approval rating on election day was 54%. Now some of that has to do with the nature of the electorate, but nonetheless, well over 50%. Um, a president in a re-election campaign, once you get to 51%, basically, it's 
pretty unlikely you're going to lose the election. Um, most polling at the end had him at about 50 percent, if not 51 percent. On election day, he was 54 uh, percent. Those voters voted for Obama 89 to 9. 53 percent of voters said that Romney's policies would favor the rich, uh, and they voted for Obama 87 to 10. Uh, another 44 percent said that uh, Obama's policies would favor the middle class. That's a higher percentage than said of same of Romney. They voted for Obama 86 to 12. 53 percent said that uh, the president was more in touch with people like them. They voted 91 to 7 for Obama. And 48 percent said they thought that Obama would handle the economy better to 49 percent who said it of, of Romney. Uh, and they voted for Obama 98 to 1. So, I mean, when you look at this and you think through it, what, what you, the conclusion you come to is that uh, Romney may have thought he won the debate about the current state of the economy, but the president won the debate about the future and where the future ought to go. The second point I'll make is that Obama did, a, as I said, a much better job of creating the electorate that was favorable to him. Um, there, was a, there was a debate all year long, and, it, and Doug and I will probably talk more about this, about, about the polls. Uh, there were a lot of conservatives, a lot of Republicans who were quite critical of, of a lot of the polling, and, and le legitimately so in some cases, as, as Doug will say. But nonetheless, part of the debate that was playing out was, would the electorate in 2012 be more like it was in 2004 in its composition, or more like it was in 2008? And there are two components of that. Um, one is, what's the share of Democrats versus Republicans in the electorate? Um, in 2004, the Bush campaign managed for the first time to make that even, 37 percent Republicans to 37 percent Democrats. Republicans have historically been at a disadvantage. In 2008, uh, it was an eight-point advantage, uh, seven-point advantage for the Democrats, for Obama. It was a, the Republicans believed, based on, you know, some evidence that they felt was there and some hope uh, that the Democrats would have a smaller, a notably smaller advantage in the party break in the election. And in fact, they didn't. It was a six-point advantage compared to a seven-point advantage last time. So they, they were wrong on that, and the Obama campaign had worked to make sure that they were pushing that envelope. The other is that, that the Republicans, in some way or another, felt that they could you know, defy demographic gravity, which is to say the steady accretion of the share of the, of the white population in the electorate. Uh, which has been going down uh, step by step for many years. And in, in 2008, it hit 74 uh, percent, the white share of the electorate, with the, with the non-white share being 26 uh, percent. Um, I think there were a lot of Republicans who believed uh, that despite some of the demographic trends, that if they did a good job on turnout, they could arrest that, at least for this election, that it would hold somewhere in the neighborhood of 74. And I think some Republicans thought it might tick back up to 75 percent. In fact, uh, the, the Obama people early on in the campaign were projecting that it would end up at 72 percent white and 18 percent uh, non-white, and in fact, that's what it was. So you, you ended up having uh, an, an electorate that was much more favorable to the president than to Governor Romney. Now, as I say, part of this was, you know, the, the, the glacial power of, of demographics and the changes that are going on in the country. And part of it was uh, the Obama campaign's kind of relentless uh, and very sophisticated uh, ground operation, um, which is more than just throwing people out on the streets. I mean, it's a, it, they, they did an incredible amount of uh, analytical work in Chicago based on what they had done before in 2008 and built on it uh, and modeled the electorate state by state. Um, they never did a national poll. They did only polling in the battleground states. They knew what they wanted. They knew, they knew the vote total that they were shooting for. Uh, they knew from their tests and their modeling uh, essentially how many times they needed to knock on your door. Uh, what's the optimal number of knocks on your door to get you to go out and vote, whether you're a high propensity voter or a low propensity voter. From that, they estimated the number of volunteers it would take in one state versus another. And from that, uh, they began early in 2011, literally when they moved out to Chicago in, in the spring of 2011, to rebuild that army. 
Uh, and what we saw on election day was it was a campaign that turned out its vote, particularly uh, in some crucial areas. The, the, the young vote uh, was higher than a lot of people thought it would be. A lot of people thought there was lack of enthusiasm with young voters that their share of the vote would decline. In fact, it went up by a point. Uh, the African-American vote, some people said they would not have the same enthusiasm that they had in 2008. In fact, they did, and in some places more. Uh, in Ohio, their share of the electorate went from 11 to 15 percent, and it's probably why the president carried Ohio. So for those reasons, um, I, I think it, it, was, uh, it, it was an election in which uh, the Obama campaign did a little bit better job than the Romney campaign on both those fronts of doing what they needed to do. So, Doug? Well, I, I think Dan's given you a pretty good idea of uh, why the election ended up the way it did. Um, I'd like to uh, concentrate on a couple of things that I think have become uh, sort of the conventional wisdom. I think you know, Dan even repeated some of them and I think aren't true. Uh, so there are a couple myths uh, that I'd like to talk about with this election. Um, the first is what I'd call the turnout myth. Um, and the, you know, the short version of this is the Democrats won this election because they had a better ground game. That is. Uh, they were better able to get their voters to the polls. Now, the victors of any war get to write the history of it, and the Obama campaign, and particularly its consultants, are saying all the great things they did and crediting themselves with winning this election, even though they were four points worse than they were um, uh, four years ago. Um, I, I think it is true uh, that the Democrats do have better uh, registration efforts and GOTV get out the vote uh, operations than the Republicans do. Uh, but this is largely because uh, the Democrats need to have uh, better operations in this area than Republicans. Uh, Republican voters manage to get registered and turn out without you doing a whole lot about it. Um, in fact, uh, you know, if, if you look at the, um, among registered voters, uh, Obama was doing two points or so better than he was among people who turned out. Um, so, you, you know, in, in terms of actually, actual performance, uh, Democrats got less votes than they would have gotten if there had been 100% turnout. Um, you know, the reason for this is, is no great piece of news. The, the Democratic groups, tend to have lower registration rates and lower turnout rates than Republicans do. Um, they're, they're younger, they're poorer, uh, they have higher mobility, uh, which means that uh, they move around and get unregistered at faster rates than uh, Republicans. Um, the dirty little secret, though, is all this doesn't really make a whole lot of difference. Um, turnout among registered voters uh, has been running close to 90 percent uh, for several decades. Uh, in 2008, the registered voter turnout rate was 89.7 percent. That was a high turnout election. Four years before, in 2004, the registered voter turnout rate in a low turnout election was 88.5 percent. Uh, when you have around 90 percent turnout, there isn't, excuse me, 90 percent registration. Uh, I, I should step back a second. The turnout rates I'm giving you are turnout rates among registered voters. Um, so when you have a 90% turnout rate, and it doesn't vary much from year to year, there actually isn't that much action to be had uh, in getting um, people to vote at uh, higher rates. Um, if you look from year to year, the turnout rates of different groups are very heavily correlated. They all go up and down together. So this year, for example, we. Um, we don't know what the turnout rates are. Uh, the best data on this comes from the current population survey and won't be available for a year. Um, for various technical reasons, the exit poll is actually not a very reliable way to estimate turnout. Uh, but uh, the overall pattern is uh, when one group goes up, they all tend to go up. So for example, uh, from uh, 2004 to 2008, the Hispanic turnout rate rose from 81 to 84 uh, percent. The black turnout rate, which had a massive increase from 2004 to 2008, it was uh, 87 percent in 2004, 92 percent in 2008, and probably was about the same this year. 
Uh, white turnout hasn't moved around a whole lot, uh, basically rose about a point from 04 to 08. Um, but overall, you see the groups move together. Um, if you do the math, the variations in turnout rate, that is getting your voters to the polls, can't make much of a difference. Uh, so for example, what does a five point increase in the black turnout rate, what you got from 2004 to 2008, and we certainly didn't have anything similar this year. Well, you know, roughly blacks are 10% of the electorate. Uh, if they increase their turnout rate by five points, which would be massive, you know, 90 to 95%, um, that would add a half a point of black voters to the electorate. Um, they vote about 50% more Democratic than the rest of the electorate. That is, they're in the mid-90s in their Democratic voting rates, whereas the rest of the electorate's uh, in the high 40s. That gets you a quarter point of extra vote. Uh, if you do the math the other way, you say that white turnout or non-black, non non-Hispanic turnout decreased by 5%. Uh, Again, it's worth roughly a quarter of a point, slightly more. The change in Hispanic turnout was worth about uh, a tenth of a point. So there's no way that you can explain uh, the size of the margin here by turnout of registered voters. A bigger effect is the composition of registered voters, which is driven largely by demography. Uh, so the biggest change we've had in the last decade uh, was in the Hispanic uh, fraction of the electorate. Uh, so for example, in 2000, Hispanics were 5.8% uh, of the electorate. Uh, of the registered voter population, excuse me. Um, and they, they've risen to about 9.2% in 2012. Um, so, you know, nearly a doubling. Uh, and that's almost entirely driven by the number of Hispanic citizens is rising uh, every year. There are more uh, Hispanics born in the U.S., um, uh, more of them are citizens, and they end up being registered, uh, Democratic, registration efforts are pretty good on that score. And that has a, a noticeable effect on the composition of the registered voter population. It's also the case that uh, the so-called C3s, the nonprofit uh, progressive groups, have been very effective uh, at running registration efforts over the last decade. Um, The uh, longer term effect of that is going to be that uh, Texas and Florida are going to become uh, Democratic states in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, and at that point, the Republicans face a really big problem, uh, that if you take California, New York, uh, Florida, and Texas, um, it's hard to assemble a, a, a substantial majority for the Republicans without uh, some of those states. Um, so overall, yes, uh, the demographic change is real, it changes the composition of the electorate, but it didn't really have a lot to do with uh, what the uh, uh, Democratic micro-targeting efforts or GOTV efforts and so forth and all the stuff uh, they are bragging about in Chicago. Um, let me uh, move to my second myth, uh, which is the sort of conventional narrative of this election is that Romney came out of the Republican convention without getting a bump. Uh, the Democrats had a much better convention. It looked like Obama got, you know, th three points maybe in the polls. Um, the rest of September was a disaster for the Romney campaign. They were talking about rape and 47% of the voters whose votes they didn't want. Uh, you name it, it was... Uh, uh, incompetent production, um, and Obama had a, a big lead, um, you know, five or six points uh, in uh, a lot of the polls. Then the first debate occurred, uh, and it looked like the president was asleep, um, and suddenly the polls showed a surge towards Romney with uh, the Gallup poll at one point having a seven-point lead among likely voters. Um, the, the bulk of the major media polls had Romney ahead. Um, and then the second and third debates, Obama performed much better and uh, recaptured the vote and was surging at the end and ended up winning, it looks like at this point, by close to four points. Um, 
the, the vote still is not counted. I think at this, uh, we're at about a 3.4% Obama lead at this point, and the bulk of the outstanding vote is probably Democratic vote. Um, so if you believe this, um, then uh, there was a lot going on in this campaign. I don't think that's the case. Um, the fact is that uh, Obama started this year with a lead over any Republican candidate. Um, it was always going to be a relatively close race. It was a poor economy, though uh, who was to blame for it was a matter of uh, dispute between Democrats and Republicans. Um, the Republican candidates were a relatively weak field. Romney had all sorts of problems in terms of um, his personal ratings. Um, it shouldn't have been a big surprise that uh, Obama won this election by a little bit, which is what happened. Um, so what was going on here? Um, so there were a lot of polling aggregation. Nate Silver was the best known of these, averaging the various polls and giving you, you know, fairly precise numbers about where the candidates were. So uh, after the Democratic Convention, uh, the 538 estimate was that Obama had a 4.3% lead, pretty close to the final outcome. Um, after the first debate, the polling average dropped to less than a one-point lead um, for Obama uh, and then ended at a two-point lead, which was a bit below what the actual outcome was going to be. So averaging the polls shows a little bit of movement, but much less than you would find in the major media polls. Um, one of the better polls traditionally has been the, the Pew poll. And so to remind you of what their numbers were, um, they run big samples. They have the highest quality methodology of any of the uh, major telephone polls. Um, in uh, mid-September, uh, among likely voters, uh, they had uh, Romney plus eight, uh, plus eight, excuse me, Obama plus eight, among registered voters plus nine, so a whopping big lead. After the first debate, they had a 12-point swing with Romney leading um, by four among likely voters, tied among registered voters. After the second debate, they had a four-point swing the other way with a then tied. And their final poll was plus three. Uh, Obama, which is pretty close to the outcome. So in the polling community, everybody's patting themselves on their shoulders, saying, what a great job we did, uh, that nearly all the polls were within the margin of error. Um, but if it had been, the election had been held 10 days earlier, uh, it would have been a disaster. Um, so were there really swings of this size? Well, it's hard to tell because most polling organizations don't give you much about the composition of their sample. But Pew, which has quite high standards, I think, uh, actually reports the full results of their questionnaire. And one of the questions they asked in every one of their polls was not just how people intended to vote in this election, but how they voted in 2008. Now, in 2008, in their September poll, which had Obama up by eight, they also had the exact same people saying that they had voted for Obama over McCain by 15 points. Now, you may recall the 2008 election. It wasn't a 15-point election. That might tip you off that the sample was a little too Democratic at that point. Um, after the first debate, where they now have Romney up by four, they had Obama leading McCain among the same voters in 2008 by five points, which is way too Republican. Um, if you, um, and then after the second debate, which was tied, they had Obama leading McCain in 2008 among those voters by eight points. And their final poll, which switched to plus three again, had Obama with a 13-point lead over McCain. What you have here is not a surge for Romney. It's a surge of people answering the poll um, who uh, were uh, Republicans at one point, that is after the first debate, uh, they were in similar overrepresentation of Democrats before the, uh, the first debate and uh, in the final poll. Um, there's a debate among pollsters of whether the polls should be weighted by uh, partisanship. 
That is, should we make sure that the fraction of Democrats is what we think it should be? The problem is we don't have any good data on what it should be, um, so we're guessing. Uh, Dan did a piece during this uh, when there was all the skewed poll nonsense about the polls being biased. Uh, if there was a bias, yes, there was a bias. They had too many Republicans in them, not uh, too many Democrats. Uh, my reaction after seeing these Pew polls was this should be the death of phone polling. <laughs> I'm in the internet polling business. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the inability to control the composition of the sample made these polls highly unreliable. Um, and uh, alternative methods, which is working off registered voter lists or doing an internet panel where you go back to the same people repeatedly, enables you to control the sample composition. So you're talking to people who are on average the same at each point in time. They're not bouncing around. Uh, the phone polls these days are in single digit response rates. So you know, 90% of the people they're dialing up, they never talk to. Uh, sample composition is a real problem here that uh, after an event has occurred, like uh, Obama's poor performance in the first presidential debate, it seems that Democrats just don't want to take polls. It's not a fun thing to talk about. Uh, um, immediate, the day after the election, we observed that Republicans did not want to take polls. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, they probably don't come to events like this either, uh, <laughs> though I do see a few. Uh, <laughs> um, the other big problem is likely voter screens. Uh, if you know that somebody is registered, it really doesn't make any difference whether they tell you they're going to vote or not. They're habitual voters and they vote in presidential elections. Um, the likely voter screens that are used in telephone polls are really a poor way of figuring out whether people are registered or not, which it turns out a fair number of people don't know if they're registered to vote. They did vote in the past. They were registered where they used to live. Are they registered now? Hard to say. Um, so the result of this is you're getting uh, some rather bad polling. Uh, and even though the bulk of the polls got the final result right, uh, most of the noise that you were seeing during the campaign was something that really didn't happen. Uh, thank you. I was asked to talk about uh, what's going to happen in the future, looking to this crystal ball, which is both the easiest and the hardest thing to do. But I thought a way of getting this at this question is, you've heard from two pros what happened on election day. And I want to talk a little bit about what Republicans think happened. And since Republicans are an endangered species in this state, I thought maybe uh, it'd be good to, to report what the, from, from the rest of the country on how they have really digested this election. I mean, there's obviously this sort of splenetic kind of sore loserish uh, populist side to the response, you know, with Rush Limbaugh talking about how Hispanics believe in Santa Claus, and this explains, you know, the sort of surge toward Obama. And there was, of course, the uh, infamous by now uh, Romney uh, um, telephone conference call with his donors, where he said that Obama just gave a bunch of money to groups, and this is, you know, what, what really cost him this election. Um, there is also a realist view, which is probably shared more among the so-called Republican establishment. I'm not sure one really truly exists, but um, given what there is, there is a sort of established view, and I would summarize it that the problem in this election was really style and execution um, and not substance. It's always very popular to uh, go after the losing candidate, and I think everyone's really happy to do it in this case. You know, and top of the list is that the candidate was the problem. Um, that as that quote to his donors suggested that Mitt Romney saw politics in transactional terms. He failed to give a compelling ideas-led, values-led case for why he should replace um, President Obama. That he started out with a structural problem, which is he thought that voters were ready to fire Obama and all he had to do was present himself as a sort of palatable alternative, a guy who did well in business, therefore he'd be a good politician. This obviously didn't work out very well. Um, the other obvious problem is that four years after one of the worst financial crisis, um, crisis in our history, 
uh, nominating a uh, plutocrat from Bain may not have been the best idea. Um, and curiously with Mitt Romney, that even though he touted his business, ma business management skills, as a political manager, he has a terrible record, which hasn't been really helped by this last election. I mean, he's lost three elections now. And, you know, obviously after an election's over, a lot of stories come from the campaign. Um, and this campaign was really very poorly run, dysfunctional, centralized. People felt they couldn't have access to the candidate. It was really run by a couple of people very close to Romney. You had the uh, debacle with this thing called Orca, uh, which was their get out the vote uh, program, which crashed the day of the election, which wasn't very good. So it was really a whale, uh, but certainly not a killer whale. Um, and I had a, uh, a Republican friend sort of tell me that, you know, at least we've been spared the Romney presidency. That's really the bright side here. Um, I think two exit polls, and, and Dan mentioned some of them, that are really amazing, but the two that really jump out at, at me are on how Romney failed to make his case is, one, who do you blame? Okay, we all know the economy is terrible. Romney kept repeating it. But then who do you blame for the poor economy? Bush or President Obama? 53% blame Bush, 38% blame President Obama. So Romney did not make the case that it's really Obama's fault, nor do he say what he would do differently. Then the other thing that really jumps out at you, there's one line about um, which candidate cares about people like me? Um, and this was the most important um, quality for about a fifth of all voters. 81 to 18% voted for Romney, sorry, sorry, for Obama on this question. So he was definitely not an empathetic character. Um, the second thing people talk about, Republicans talk about, is demographics. Obviously, there's a problem, particularly with Hispanic voters. George Bush got 44%. He won Colorado, Iowa, New Mexico, Nevada, Florida, and Virginia, all states that Romney has lost. If Romney had done as well as Bush with Hispanics, he may not necessarily have won the election, but he certainly would have, would have done better in a lot of these swing states. So, but this is still, this can be overdone, at least I think Republicans think that the demographic point can be slightly overstated. That Hispanics and Asian Americans are not yet a captive group of a Democratic Party. Therefore, people like Jeb Bush will now become much more prominent, making the case he's been, he's been making for the last 10 years that the Republicans have to stop alienating uh, the largest growing voting bloc in the country, which would help. Um, and I think what really, what really did Romney in apparently was that I think they, the campaign panic when Rick Perry went into the race. And they didn't really see a, a way to outmaneuver him except by going hard right on the immigration question. And they failed to understand that uh, Rick Perry could undermine himself uh, quite effectively. But they were stuck with the whole self-deportation um, nonsense. Um, but. But I think Democrats is really overdone that they see that you know, Democrats have a, their own demographic problems. They're losing um, white uh, working class voters. Uh, they do terribly with uh, married people. Uh, Romney won that group by 14%. Um, and in four years, which is the best news of all for Republicans, uh, there won't be President Obama around to excite, white, uh, to, to, to excite uh, young voters. And you, you probably will not have um, the same turnout among African Americans. Um, and not, just, not to mention that the uh, coming Democratic, the, the, the possible candidates for president will tend to be uh, actually older, uh, people like Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, which is also a demographic challenge, while Republicans have a young bench coming forward. Um, the third thing they talk, think about is values, that they got outmaneuvered on the wedge issues, that obviously they have a problem with abortion, with gay marriage, and immigration. The country is going in a different direction from, from Republicans. But I think they don't really quite know, you know, sounding like Democrats on these issues will not win you those voters. But you may also want to uh, sound a bit less unappealing and uh, stop nominating uh, candidates like Richard Murdoch and Todd Akin and losing elections that you should be uh, winning easily. Um, but. Most importantly, I think the consensus seems to be that it was not the ideas, it was not conservative ideas, it was not bedrock Republican ideas that cost them, that cost the Republicans this election. Um, 
that really the Republicans hit a low point in 2008. I mean, this was really a, a party that was bankrupt, uh, certainly politically, but also intellectually, after the Bush years of big government, out of control spending, the economic crisis, big, big wars. And for all the, it's very fashionable now to blame the Tea Party for foisting these terrible candidates on the party in state races. But the Tea Party kind of reinvigorated the party, gave it a much clearer um, raison d'etre, which is we are the party of uh, small government, we're the party that's concerned about out of control debt, we're the party that, that, that worries about America going down a road, which is um, more, more a European social entitlement state, which is not, um, which we can't afford. And I think on this point, that there's a conviction still that not only because they kept the House, um, that this is not the Tory party of England of 1997, which was pushed into the wilderness. These ideas are still current. Now, whether they're right or not is a different question. But, you know, as, as Dan mentioned, you look at the, uh, the exit polls. You know, should government do more to solve problems or is doing too much? 51 said they're doing too much. 43% said they should, should be doing uh, they should be doing more, which is an exact flip from 2008, when 51% said the government should be doing more. Uh, should taxes be raised to pay for the budget deficit? Naturally, most people don't want their taxes to be raised. 63% say no. Obviously, if you ask about top 1%, 99% may say yes. But um, on the and on the, it is still arguably more of a center-right country, although you can argue over what that precisely means. Democrats have a plus 6%, have a six point advantage in party registration. However, conservatives, um, when you ask people are they liberal, moderate, or conservative, conservatives are about 35%, liberals are about 25%, and moderates are 41%. Now, of those moderates, Obama won them by 56 to 41. However, most people self-identify as being in the middle and slightly more to the right. Um, Rep Republicans think they're winning the argument at the state level. Um, they control 30 governor's mansions. The real laboratories for reform are in Wisconsin, in Ohio. I mean, ironically, Ohio, John Kasich has helped kind of revive Ohio, which made it possible for Obama to win Ohio. Um, so, you know, what Walter Russell Mead calls the, uh, the blue state social model and the red state social model. You obviously live in the blue state social model, um, which is probably the prime example of a blue state social model. Um, and Republicans think that people don't want to live in California. It seems pretty nice to me, a lot of sun. But, uh, um, but there is not a feeling of, um, of a chastening of the sort of bread and butter Republican ideas. And I think this is going to determine how Republicans come into, um, I mean, obviously the current debate over the fiscal cliff but it will also determine how they govern, or not govern, sorry, how they, uh, how they um, function as the um, dominant party in the House and the opposition in the next two years and, and, and probably four. Um, in the short term, um, you clearly have seen in the last few days that the more Republican so-called moderates are sounding more moderate. Um, you had Bob Corker, the senator from, from Tennessee. You had Saxby Chambliss. Um, from Alabama, Leslie, um, Lindsey Graham uh, from South Carolina, saying um, no to Grover Nordquist, who made them all sign a, a no tax pledge, and saying we have to put these things on the table. And these things will be on the table. John Boehner has said he wants to put revenues on the table. And um, the Republicans are going to be forced to uh, swallow hard if, if they want a deal, but they're not willing to go as far as some people on the left um, would want them to go. I think the, the, really the, the trick here for President Obama would be how he treats the losing party here differently than he did in 2011, and what, how he behaves differently knowing that he doesn't have to run for re-election again. Um, clearly, there's a consensus in the Republican Party that um, we need tax reform but the dirty word is tax rates. They don't want to increase tax rates, partly because it's politically toxic still for the party, but also because they, they deeply believe that this is going to harm the economy. Um, however, there is a growing consensus, and I think this is sort of, it's not hard to imagine the contours of a deal that gets rid of exemptions, puts a cap on deductions, 
uh, and that finds a way to get up to that 800 billion um, revenue figure that John Boehner was ready to sign on to last year and even higher. Um, so in the short term, there's going to be, they will have to make concessions, and I, th I think they probably will. Over the long term, I'm not sure sure how accommodating the Republican Party will be, partly because they don't, they don't think they've lost the intellectual argument. They think they had a bad candidate, they think they had sort of ran a bad election, they think the ideas still work. And even if John Boehner wanted to, he, cannot, he can only go so far because the Tea Party isn't that chastened, and they were reelected, and they feel, you know, Mitch McConnell, um, who's not a Tea Party guy, but the um, minority leader came out with an interview in my paper three days after the elections. There's no way I'm going to raise tax rates, um, and I'm not going to vote for it. So there are these red lines in the Republican Party, and I think this is going to keep making, it will still make um, the coming weeks and months quite uncomfortable. And in this way, the election wasn't really all that clarifying. Right, thanks. Um, well, um, there's a good thing about, the bad thing about being last is all the good points have been made. The, the good thing is nobody expects you to talk too long. Um, <laughs> so the, as soon as the election's over, given the 24-7 coverage in the United States, that immediately means MSNBC, CNN, blah, 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 they all immediately talk about what did the election mean? And so uh, I'm going to talk about that in several aspects. First thing, for democratic activists, the election meant it's a mandate for a liberal agenda. This election shows that uh, the president was right to win, uh, the president's health care policies, uh, tax, tax, raising taxes, et cetera, uh, uh, green, what, whatever you favored, that's what the election was a mandate for. Now, because you lose, Republicans have a different problem. One, they, one view is they nominated a lefty. Uh, uh, they nominated a lefty. But I tell you, uh, I gave a speech to a Hoover audience in Santa Barbara the other day, and I read quotes uh, about what was wrong with Romney as a president, and it turns out those were quotes in the South Carolina Republican primary. So, uh, so, that, so, so I'm not sure that Romney was such a bad candidate. Uh, the issues against him were pretty clear from the Republican side as well. Uh, and the Republicans are not clear on what a growth policy is. Any, any, any economist that's in favor of growth wouldn't have been bashing China. They would have been favoring free trade, et cetera. So uh, the Republican Party created some problems for it. Within the party, then, they're going to have disputes. One, the, they nominated a lefty, shouldn't have done that. There are some people who say, well, you have to open the party, otherwise it'll never win. And uh, that's, that's, that has policy consequences that they don't often talk about. If you open the party to immigration, how, how much do you have to change immigration policy? And changing immigration policy in some ways doesn't mean that suddenly you're going to get the Latino vote come over to your side. Just like if you have more Republicans now favoring gay marriage or abortion doesn't mean young women under uh, 35 are suddenly going to leap and become Republicans. Uh, it helps, but on the other hand, there's cross pressure. It means you may lose. Uh, some votes of the, uh, of the uh, conservative, social conservative right. And then there's finally uh, Doug's uh, point that he alluded to that is demographic death uh, over time, all these groups. I, I'm a little suspicious of those demographic death arguments. I'm old enough now that I've seen both parties die uh, over my lifetime and they're still here. Uh, like at one point in the 70s, oh, youth were always gonna be Democrat and then when Reagan got in, there was a huge switch of young people to the Republican Party. So it depends on circumstances, though in general you have to say it doesn't look good for them. So, so Republican activists, because they lost the election, there's this big fight about what it meant. And, and basically the heart and soul, as Matt talked about, heart and soul is the same. Now the business community and others that I'm more familiar with, what they want is they want things to get fixed. They don't want to go over the fiscal cliff, they want some stability, and if that's stability or whatever the margins of that are. So, uh, so in terms of the Democratic activists or Republican activists, they're gonna say what they have to say and you can, then you watch, if, you want, if you're on the left, watch MSNBC, you'll get your view. If you're on the right, watch Fox, you'll get your view and, and so on. But the bottom line is I think most Americans want the Congress and the President to work together and fix things. So that's, that's uh, the, the next part. Well, what, what about the results? What did they, sometimes when you want to fix things, you give one party a majority and they get to do what they want. Well, the electorate didn't do that. Basically, the election changed nothing. 
the, uh, Obama was reelected narrowly. His margin smaller than it was before. Democratic numbers are up in the House, they're up in the Senate, but they're still in a minority in the House of Representatives. And uh, essentially, we should be used to this because since 1980, we've had divided government 75% of the time. So that's what we got. We had divided government going into the election, uh, we spent millions, billions of dollars, and we got divided government coming out. <laughs> so that means, well, now you have to get to the questions. Where's Shanto go? Heidi, the Fishkin questions on, uh, well, I'll tell you, Fishkin's not paying us, so I'm giving a short answer. Um, <laughs> so the lame duck section, no, the lame, so the first prediction would be, well, what about the lame duck session and the fiscal cliff? Now, the fiscal cliff was set up because there's incentives for both sides to compromise and get things done. So in order to answer that question, you, you'd have to be smarter than Einstein because there's like nine dimensions. I'm going to talk about a few of them. I have to know the first following three probabilities. One, what's the probability that uh, President Obama, what does, he really, what does he really stand for? Now, this is the first time he doesn't have to face the Democratic base. And if you looked at uh, sort of the, there are two sources of nasty criticism of the president. One was the Republicans, and two was his own party, the left and the Democratic Party. Thought he hadn't done enough. So the question is, now he doesn't ever have to run again. So is he willing to compromise? To what extent is he willing to compromise? That's the first thing I have to know. Second thing I have to know is, can the House Speaker Boehner, who almost had a budget deal with President Obama earlier, can he contain the Tea Partiers in his party to keep from, uh, to, to get a deal, okay? And that's, there are 219 House members, some Democrats, a handful of Democrats, who've signed the Norquist tax pledge. Okay, so that's, that's the second probability. Third uh, probability is what about the Senate? Well, the Senate has Rule 22, as you know, which is the filibuster, which means 40 senators can pretty well slow anything down. 39 senators uh, have signed the Norquist tax pledge. Some have backed off slightly. And secondly, the median Democrat in the Senate is a Democrat like the senator from West Virginia, <coughs> Montana, North Dakota, and Missouri, who did not attend the Democratic Convention and never came out in support of the president in the election. So the 50th senator, even though they're a Democrat, is not someone who comes from a state like California. And that's shocking, but not all Democrats are in California. <laughs> well, seems like it. Um, so now all of these three probabilities, all of which are somewhat difficult, uh, those occur over a wide variety of possibilities. The first thing, the one thing I'm pretty sure that'll happen, they will reinstitute the Social Security tax. They're going to they're gonna have to drop that. They're going to have to drop that deduction. But other than that, there's a ho whole set of questions. What if we flatten rates? What if we drop deductions? There's a whole set of possibilities over those other three probabilities, which gives you dimensionality. That's why you figure like you should be Einstein. So having said that, the great thing about tenure is I can make a prediction, and if it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> so my guess is that in the lame duck Congress, they'll kick the can down the road. They'll probably get a little six-month deal where they hand the basic problem, over, uh, uh, basic problem over to the new Congress. Is there some reason here for, um, is there some reason here for hope? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, what do I mean by hope? Will I put the probability above 0.5? No. Um, has it increased? Yeah, I think it has increased on the grounds that the American people want something done, and a coalition of business people, both uh, Republic people who contributed a good deal to Romney and others, are putting pressure on the Congress to get something to, done, because in some sense, at an ultimate level, they would prefer stability, even if it's not the ideal point for them, they would prefer stability closer to that ideal point than nothing. So I think uh, the, that, that coalition of businessmen and women who are working on this issue, putting pressure on the administration and on the Republican Congress, they're beginning to have some effect, but the possibility of all my knowing all three of those uh, probabilities and what will happen over all the possibilities, that's something you're just going to have to hang in and uh, watch. And I would uh, I'd listen to the BBC if I wanted real results. Um, <laughs> thank you.
You're, you're managing the show now. Uh, right? Yes, I'm trying to figure out. Mandy's in the back with the... So people who, who would like to ask questions um, have access uh, to a mic. Right, Mandy? Oh, you will come to them. Okay, so I guess the easiest way to do this would be to simply raise your hand if you want to ask a question. That will send Mandy Don't rushing to, to your place. <laughs> Say that again? Oh, okay, fine. I will be the gatekeeper. You want us to answer some questions back and forth while you guys are figuring this out? No, uh, I think we will have plenty. Okay, so there's a question in the back there, Mandy. Yeah, my impression is that the women's vote went very heavily to Obama by almost 10 points. And the women's vote is probably half the, half the voting population. A little over. You didn't discuss that very much. And I wonder what you think about uh, what the Republican Party can do to change that women's vote. Who wants to, uh, Dan? Um, you're right. Uh, the women's vote went 55-44 uh, for Obama. The men voted 45-52 for Romney. And interestingly, um, Obama's margin among women was a little lower than it was four years ago. He was up by 13 points four years ago. One of the things that we saw was that in a couple of states where there was heavy advertising, particularly around women's issues, and uh, Virginia was one of those, that um, Obama's share uh, or margin among women in Virginia actually went up, even though it went down nationally. And the same was true in, in Florida. Um, I was at a focus group last fall or a couple of months ago in Virginia, and there were 10 or 12 undecided voters, and they all said the big issue for them was the economy. I think one or two may have said health care. Uh, but everybody said, you know, I'm voting on the economy. And then when the moderator went around and asked people kind of what their, why they were undecided and what their reservations were, uh, three of the women in the group cited the issues of reproductive rights and other women's issues as concerns they had about why they were reluctant to vote for Romney. And it said to me that the, that, 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 that the advertising that was done uh, and the messaging that you saw at the Democratic Convention did get through in, in, in some of these states. Um, you know, the, the Democrats do well with unmarried women and the Republicans do well with married women. And uh, the issue is what's, the, what's that share? How does that balance out? Um, they're, more, they're more unmarried women. And, and in the overall electorate, as Dave said, it's 53% of the voters were, were women this time. So. Um, Part of it is, uh, as Matt suggested, how do you talk about some of these issues? How much prominence do you give them? And that's one of the challenges that the Republican Party is going to face. They can't, they can't necessarily abandon uh, positions and principles that, that the majority of their members hold. Um, but there are ways to talk about them. There are ways to emphasize or de-emphasize them. Uh, there are ways to talk around them. Um, but they've, they've got to figure out a more effective way to do it. Uh, you know, the married women uh, voted for uh, Romney, and white women voted uh, by 12-point margin, 56-44, uh, for Romney, and that constitutes Democrats' problems. So that means that I think 96% of African-American women voted for uh, Obama, 71%, 75%, something like that, of uh, Hispanic women. So, so the bottom, so the bottom line on that is uh, that's a very difficult issue for Republicans. What's the trade-off? Because if you suddenly traded that off and said, "Okay, so we're going to go, and now we're fa we're pro we're pro-choice now," well, you're going to lose a bunch of voters that are pro-life in some way. So that that constitutes a really difficult problem. Dan's probably right, and you can talk about, it, but I don't see how Romney could have talked about it any better. He came on and he said very clearly to people, I don't plan on changing anything on that law. And he couldn't say it earlier, given the Republican primaries. So that's, that's a tough one uh, for, them, uh, for the party to deal with, because any way you move one way, you lose people on the other side. But, but I think the basic problem is, was that it was, it was a branding problem that grew out of the 
weakness of the field at the presidential level and also at the Senate level for the Republicans. You can imagine much better candidates dealing this, this issue much, more, much better that women don't only care about reproductive rights, they care about jobs, about education, about you know, uh, a better future. You are reducing it down, so you don't really abandon your, your position on, on, on choice, but you also learn to talk about it differently. I heard a story secondhand that apparently they, uh, the RNC in Washington sent out some high-priced consultants to go prep Richard Murdoch for his debate, and then they went over the question where he was asked about his position on abortion and, um, and you know, uh, whether in case of rape it was legitimate. They sort of went over it. Murdoch went out there. He didn't do it all what they told him to do. He gave his answer that uh, not only sunk his campaign, but also helped the Obama uh, campaign drive this as a wedge issue, that Aiken and Murdoch became national figures. And uh, you just stop. If you get asked about abortion and um, rape, don't mention the, them in the same sentence. The it's woman, a very simple <laughs> the it's woman, a rule. Yeah, but the woman who was uh, the Republican uh, establishment's candidate was perfectly good in that dimension. And in fact, uh, 1.5 million of the money that went to uh, the uh, ultimate, uh, the rape guy, he, he, that came from Democrats. She, she contrib the senator contributed to his campaign. That should be a pretty good sign that maybe this guy. And Republican voters in that primary still voted him the winner. And uh, I, uh, so the, pri the primaries uh, in the Democratic Party drive candidates to the left, and the Republican Party, uh, they drive them to the right. And that, and I just, I don't see uh, any real prospects for much change there. Yeah, after the election, uh, I ran a poll where we asked uh, Romney voters, would you have preferred to have had a candidate um, who was uh, closer to Obama on social issues, but had the same economic positions as Romney. Um, and we did the same thing for Obama voters. We asked them, would you have preferred to have had a candidate that was closer to Romney on economic issues, but had Obama's position on social issues? And among both sets of voters, it was 13% said they would have preferred somebody who was more moderate, closer to the center on social issues if they're Republican voters or economic issues if they're Democratic voters. 75% in both cases said no. Uh, so what you have here is essentially, yes, if one party could move closer to the center on the dimension they're off, which is social issues for Republicans or economic issues for Democrats, yeah, they'd pick up votes and they'd win by bigger margins. Will they do it? No way. 75% of the base of each party is happy with exactly where they are at the moment. Okay, I'll make a radical suggestion. Is you may not need a mic. If you just speak up, I think we can hear you. Right? Go, go right ahead. Yeah, I have a two-pronged question. Thank you. <laughs> so much for that. It was a radical suggestion. You can hear because you're in the front of the room. Physics. Oh. I have a two-pronged question. The first prong relates to the money that was spent by anonymous corporations damning the current administration, what effect did that really have in the, for the, in the election, and what do you think it's going to have in the future? And the same question relates to the efforts made by the Republican governors and state legislation groups to make it more difficult for minorities to vote. What will that have? What effect did that have? in the election, and what effect will it have in the future? Uh, I don't think any of them had any effect. Uh, that uh, The vast amount of money that was uh, spent uh, in the end canceled out. Obama had much more, spent more. Um, and uh, any party that's uh, basing its strategy on suppressing the vote uh, is probably headed for oblivion. I, I agree. I don't think I had. I don't think I, I don't think I had much of an effect. The president ended up spending 140 million dollars more, raising uh, uh, almost twice as much money and spending much more, and advertising states in all of the all of the key states. The president had early money bought in, and his TV ads were twice as frequent as uh, Romney's. Romney spent more time in the states, but that's because he couldn't buy TV time. So I, I don't think that was an effect. 
And uh, the suppression of the vote is uh, not a good thing, but that's another case where there's a really easy compromise. If Democrats would agree to, uh, if Democrats would agree to uh, do the things to clean voter blocks, uh, which are now easily available, and Republicans would agree to drop the silly things, that's a compromise most Americans are in favor of. But again, because the guts of both parties are opposed to that, that's not one you're going to get. I think it, it's just not going to happen. So this will come up every election. The 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 campaign spent um, 875 million dollars on presidential ads, the two candidates and the affiliated outside groups. Uh, almost all of that in, what, nine states. Um, you, you've never seen the volume of advertising. I was speaking to Shanto's class this morning, and, and I said, you know, if you lived here in California, you didn't realize what people in Ohio or Virginia. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, uh, the, the ads were nonstop. Um, I mean, literally. Um, you know, if you watched local news, you thought, you know, you got three minutes of news and 27 minutes of advertising. And, you know, it clearly went beyond a point where it had an effect. I mean, people tune it out. Um, you know, we're all, you know, we're all intelligent people. And at a point you just say, well, I've heard this. I don't need to listen to it anymore. And then they tuned it out. So, um, and, and the, the question of the, you know, the, the money from, um, you know, unnamed contributors, whether it's corporations or individuals, I mean, you know, that's, that's something that bothers everybody, and it's easily solved if Congress would require uh, transparency for, for all of the, how, however you set up your organization under the tax code, that you have to report the names of your donors. Um, we're not gonna get money out of politics. Well, we've tried it a whole bunch of ways, and we can nibble around the edges, but money always finds its way into campaigns. But there are ways to make it more transparent, and, and one would hope that would happen. There was a hypocrisy in the whole debate about campaign financing. People like the money in politics if it gives them the results they support. For example, a lot of these gay marriage referendums that have now, there were four that went in favor for the first time, in favor of allowing gay marriage at the state level. Um, the vote in the New York legislature to uh, legalize gay marriage, that was driven by a very expensive, uh, bipartisan uh, um, push um, that cost a lot of money. And people were hailing this. Ah, this is wonderful, free speech has won out, you can educate voters on these issues and they can change their minds. So um, it's a free speech issue and, and people aren't stupid. Obviously Karl Rove did not, and his millions did not win this election for, for Mitt Romney. So it'd be nice to also tone down the, um, I think, uh, overwrought uh, worries about this health of American democracy because money's being spent. <laughs> Carl's still waiting for Ohio to Okay. They <laughs> still haven't count, yeah. counted all those votes. That's right. All those provisional ballots are yeah. still... Uh, throughout the entire campaign, uh, the media, as well as President Obama, and even uh, Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan, they all said over and over again that we understand that President Obama inherited the worst economy since the Great Depression. And everybody accepted that. Why did the Republicans roll over and play dead on this issue? And weren't they aware of the intimate involvement in the subprime crisis by the Democrat Party? Had they not heard of the Community Reinvestment Act? Had they not heard of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the people that ran it? Why didn't they attempt to tie the Democrats uh, into the subprime crisis and especially those corporations that got bailed out, uh, most of them were run by Democrats, not Republicans. Why did, they, why did Republicans roll over and play dead on that issue? Well, I think this is actually where the candidate was the problem. Um, Mitt Romney did not explain one. Um, he kept saying how bad the economy is, which is really, I think, after a while, it started to annoy voters because they know how bad the economy is because they actually live in it, and they're not jet skiing on a lake in New Hampshire. It, in, in the summer. Um, he didn't, one, he didn't explain uh, why it happened. And he didn't get into the story of, of, you know, what led to the housing bubble and, and, and why it all fell apart. 
two, he didn't quite until the end where he I think he did a better job of when he rebooted the campaign and, and he didn't quite explain of, of of what he would do. But most importantly, I don't think he explained of how he would be different from George Bush. He didn't say I disagree with George Bush on this policy. I think he was there was too much easy money. He o overlooked what was happening at at, at, Fa at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, and that's a political failure. And and I think sort of. Again, this is very self-serving to say, but blaming the media, um, you know, you are just shooting the messenger, although maybe that's enjoyable too. <laughs> so I, my view of that is, um, I don't think it's very e easy to do. First of all, uh, you're asking to say, okay, with 80% of the American public thinking the banks uh, won the bailout, they didn't like it, nobody liked it, so now you want to make an argument that says, well, I, I want to defend these actions that the bank did. In short, you're getting into a very difficult issue, governing versus campaigning. And when you govern, Democrats and Republicans had to agree, the banks had to be saved. And then I remember people screaming, and my, uh, my daughter's going, well, why is he appointing a banker? Uh, why is he appointing the banker as Secretary of Trump? Well, who would you appoint? <laughs> you wouldn't, wouldn't you want someone that knew something so much? So the point is, I think, at the time it happened, Democrats and Republicans realized, in general uh, agreed that this had to be done. They did it. And then in the campaign, it's pretty difficult to get in and explain. Uh, think of the details. It's very, very hard to explain. I, I don't see how any candidate could have done it. The American public still isn't very happy with bankers. They're not happy with the bailout. And Obama had the great advantage of he wasn't president when it happened. And he took advantage of it. And I don't know of any candidate for the Republican Party that could have explained it clearly and cleanly because it is not a clear and clean explanation as to what happened. Okay, Mandy, there's an insistent question on the back. Right? <laughs> well, <clears throat> uh, looking into f the future, I would like to flag two issues. One is about electoral reform in the U.S. Uh, most people, many people here would be familiar of what the Republican, well-known Republican, uh, David Trump has written about the electoral system that's a shame. And I think uh, the Bush election made that issue very dramatically uh, brought to light, but nothing seems to have been done. So looking to the future, would you say that the two parties can come to some sensible agreement and have a, an electoral system of which America can really be proud, question number one. Number two, there have been two views about the stimulus. And there is this um, new book that has come out about the New, new Deal, and uh, which of course raises this uh, stimulus sky high. So I think for the future we also have to see what place that kind of policy, economic policy, expansionist deficit financing will have in U.S. policy making. These two issues I would like to put to the better. Sure. Um, I think on the, it's, it's really, I think the, the reform of the electoral college will never happen. Um, partly because the Republicans um, have lost the popular vote in uh, five of the last six elections and they see the demographic trends. But more importantly that um, there is a genius to the, what the, what the framers did um, we have a clarity with the Electoral College um, that, uh, you know, Obama won by, I guess, the margins inc increasing, but his victory is much clearer on the Electoral College map than, uh, than it is in the popular vote. And uh, I, just, I just don't see this going anywhere, although Democrats would love to. Yeah, I, issue. I, I agree with Matt. I don't think that there's the will <clears throat> or the desire on the part of either party to, to upend the system. I mean, a lot of people have criticisms of it, and legitimately so. Um, it, it's, if you think about the way campaigns are done today, and as I said before, the, neither, neither of the campaigns did a poll of the nation in this, in this election. They polled a composite of the battleground states, and they polled individual battleground states. And so the election was fought out in those swing states um, because they were trying to aggregate up enough electoral votes to get to 270. If you did it on the basis of the popular vote, you'd see a different kind of an election. Um, 
you'd see a lot of Democratic time spent in California trying to ramp up the Democratic vote, and you'd see you know Republicans spending more time in other states. Now, as Doug says, this, this is not as elastic as some people think, but you would get a different kind of an election, and I don't know that it would be any more satisfying to people, um, and, and I'm not sure that it would it would produce significantly different event. I mean, this is this is a, a sort of a strange system, but um, but but people understand it and they know what those rules are, um, and sort of leaping off into the unknown is something that neither party's got an appetite to do. Twice in the 50s, uh, Montcudier Lodge Gossett, there were, uh, in the 1950s, there were uh, attempts bipartisan, Democrats and Republicans, to reform the Electoral College. In both cases, it was beaten in the Senate by a combination of big states and small states. Big states like it because uh, they get more attention because if you win by one electoral vote in California, you get a whole bunch of electoral college votes, and small states like it because without that, they wouldn't even get one. So no one would ever bother to go to those states. So a combination of big states and small states made it. I would say that I think over time there will be changes, the change in Nebraska, change in Maine. I think there is some building of that, and the change is gonna come piecemeal, kind of state by state, but I would, I would guess that you know, 40 years from now we'll have a slightly different electoral system. Yeah, I agree that electoral college reform is highly unlikely. But um, over the since the 2000 election, uh, there's been quite a bit of change in election administration. So, uh, very few states are using uh, punch cards, uh, and there's been an enormous increase in uh, vote by mail and early voting. Um, we still have a situation where we can't count the vote quickly and accurately. Uh, that anything less than a tenth of a point margin in a state would require a recount, which will yield a uh, significantly different result than the first count. And if you recount again, you'll get yet another count. Um, I think that's largely a function of antiquated systems and conservatism among election administrators. Okay, we'll take a little bit. We've got time for two more questions. So. Oh. In view of the fact that all college campuses seem to turn out Democrats, do you think we should not send our children to college? <laughs> well, well, my view is my, my view of that is my view of that is you, you've been too long in California. I, I suggest if you went to Texas A&M and the University of Alabama, you might find a different result. <laughs> so. So here's what's gonna happen. Here's what's gonna happen. You ain't sending your kid to Alabama. <laughs> I can say uh, he sent his daughters to college, and they all vote Democratic. <laughs> they do, yeah, they do. <laughs> no, I'm. Okay, we'll, word on that. okay they've one answered one. it effectively. One here. Let's have a question up in the front. We've been here, here, you got one on the right there. Okay, we'll take we'll two. Take, that'll, okay. that'll be the last question. Yeah. No, no, gentleman in the middle there. Right? Yeah, there was a lot of discussion about how things, how, how both parties are off to their uh, sides, the Democrats to the left and the Republicans to the right, and I wondered if there was any sense of the new rules in California changing that, where, uh, that are meant to drive people to the center. What do you think, Doug? <laughs> Go for it, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it tends to work uh, that, you know, when your parties are separated, uh, having a primary system like the one in California at the moment that's open uh, does tend to uh, move the candidates a bit towards the center, which I think is generally a good thing. Now, of course, that meant those new campaign rules meant that there are two fewer Republicans now in the United States House of Representatives, so I doubt that the Republican Party in California will be big advocates of this. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I don't think we've seen enough yeah. of, of, of this style to know what its real effect is. I mean, and, and proponents of these kinds of reforms often overpromise the what the impact will be, and it takes a while for it to to, to play out. Um, you know, whether it's what term limits would do to change the basic nature of things and improve it, uh, which hasn't played out in the way that a lot of proponents of term limits have. I suspect the same thing. It might, it you know, as Doug says, it may move things at the margins, um, and that might be helpful. Um, but I just think there are so many other forces at work today that it, you know, that it, it, it's not going to do exactly what the proponents suggest it will do. I, I used to think that the major, if you, uh, I used to ask students uh, 
American politics, if you, I'd say you could have one change, you could make one change, and you don't have to worry about getting it done, what would it be? And I always thought the right answer to that question was primaries. So if you didn't have the primaries the way they are, you wouldn't have the Democrats to the left, the Republicans to the right. And then, you know, then I got to thinking that, well, if you've got five to six million people on each side that are, very, are, are really concerned, and they've got money, and they've got ideas, well, even having a primary system isn't going to keep them from having an effect on the political system. It's hard to be, so 70, I'll give you an example, 74% of Republicans in California are pro-choice. Why doesn't the Republican platform in California reflect that? And the answer is because those people have jobs and stuff. They don't go to Sacramento and spend eight weeks a year lobbying for uh, that sort of stuff. So the point is if you're committed and you've got money and you've got ideas, it's hard to keep that from driving the political parties. It just, it's just hard. Thank you for your presentations. Um, actually, I have two questions, but you could take either or both. Um, uh, a lot of the information that you presented was regarding a party affiliation uh, and race, and I was wondering if any other uh, demographic information is useful to help understand ourselves regarding maybe rural versus urban and suburban, college education and income, and if you could um, speak a little bit to that. And then my second question is, do you know of any upcoming or forthcoming reports that would be helpful for Americans to use to better understand ourselves and promote across the aisle conversations um, in our, you know, Congress as well as um, in our living rooms, um, you know, and amongst neighbors? Thank you. Party ID is still the dominant, yeah. dominant uh, characteristic in terms of how somebody's going to vote. And it's gotten more so um, in recent years. You know, there, there's been a lot written about how much information campaigns now know about you. And, and they know a tremendous amount uh, to the point that it's a little scary. Um, if, if you knew how much they knew about you, you'd probably all get up and rebel about that we're in a, some sort of a you know, big brother state. Um, but the truth of the matter is, if you talk to people in these campaigns, they will acknowledge that, you know, that 90% of what they have, or 94% of what they have, is not particularly helpful. Um, you know, again, all of this is at the margins, but that a few things are, and party identification is the single most important thing you want to know about somebody at this point. I, mean, I think what was also sort of very really striking is the difference between the Obama campaign and, and the Romney campaign on, on using these online tools that, as four years ago, uh, you know, the sort of narrative coming into Election Day was uh, Romney's really cut up, he's got a better ground game, this is not the McCain campaign all over again. But in fact, it was the McCain campaign all over again, that, you know, that Obama was doing things that were, that credit card companies do to identify who you are. You know, if you go to a Planned Parenthood website, uh, they'll find a way to get you a mailer or, or, a, or an ad on your screen for Obama that will sort of target you on that issue, on the issue of reproductive rights, for example. Um, someone was telling me a story that uh, they got an email from the campaign saying, thanks for voting, but your brother down in Louisiana hasn't voted yet. Can you, can you give him a call <laughs> to make sure he goes to the polls today? This is an Obama voter, um, and, uh, and, and, and Ronnie was doing none of this. Um, Yeah, uh, no, both sides do micro-targeting. There are Republican micro-targeting operations and Democratic ones. The, there's a very vibrant community on the Democratic side called the Analyst Institute that has done very innovative work, um, somewhat creepy occasionally. Um, and actually one of the better stories is it's very hard to persuade people how to vote. So when you actually do it experimentally, you can't move voting much, but one thing that seems to work is telling people that you're going to watch whether they voted or not, uh, and after the election to inform them that we know that you didn't vote, and, and that actually does get people out to vote. <laughs> and you find that creepy? <laughs> 1984. Yes. Okay. Well, right. I'd like to thank the panel and uh, all. Of you.